<laughs> okay, well, there has to be funny heads. Funny heads are I walk. This is uh, no good. No, that's so, the next one just fine. Yeah. Make note of that for the next quarter speaker series and maybe wrap up a, a little quicker in this in the season. Um, but we are excited to um, have uh, James here today, and Stacy's going to introduce us. It's, uh, Stacy was instrumental in connecting with James and making that, um, making this, pulling this together. So uh, she should. Thanks for being here every day, today, everybody. I can't talk about the last part of my voice here, but uh, to tell you a little bit about James Ernest, he has 17 years of game industry experience in his design, more than 200 original card games, board games, and computer games. He's the president of Cheap Ass Games, famous for quirky board and card games, including Kill Dr. Lucky, Give Me the Brain, Button Men, and Brawl. He's also co-founder of Lone Shark Games, creator of hobby games, including the Pirates of the Spanish Main, Unspeakable Words, and Lords of Vegan. He won two awards. Lords of Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Lords of Vegas is no, very good. different. I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. Did I like that one? <laughs> I stand corrected. He won 10 origin awards for game design, car design, game design, and graphic design, including two Vanguard awards for design and innovation, and is a member of the Origins Awards Hall of Fame. As game design manager for Carbonated Games at Microsoft, he was lead designer for Xbox Live games, including Hexic 2, Uno Rush, Full House Poker, and Fable 2 Pub games, as well as web-based games, Flowers, and Hoppin. As senior staff designer for the Amazing Society, he was co-author of the collectible card game, The Master Game Economy, and the monetization model for the Marvel Superhero Squad Online. He's a frequent lecturer at gaming schools and conferences, and is co-author of two poker books, Dealer's Choice and The Art of Texas Hold'em. He currently works as lead designer at Spry Fox Games, where he's working on a super secret new computer game. Would you please join me in welcoming Mr. James Ernest. Hello, everyone. Uh, where shall we start? I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about my background and how I got to where I am now in the gaming industry and also a little bit about my game design philosophy. And then I want to just open it up for questions and talk about what you want to talk about. Um, I've been a game designer for, according to that, 17 years. It scares me to hear that. Um, <laughs> but uh, really, I've been a game designer all my life. And, and the, the first things that I remember doing when I was driving a lot through the Midwest with my mother the game was called Cow, and you would just call out when you saw a field of cows on your side of the, of the <laughs> road. And even then, I was thinking about game balance because I was a kid, and so I had the disadvantage of being a child. But the driver had the disadvantage of being distracted by driving, so I figured it was kind of balancing. <laughs> when I was in high school, I wrote a chess variant that was part of a fantasy novel. Um, you know, everybody writes a fantasy novel when they're in high school. At least all my friends do. And it was a terrible book, but uh, I spent a lot of time working on the chess variant. And it was, in my imagination, it was an, uh, like a, a precursor of chess. So it had all the pieces, but a lot of different rules. And I spent a lot of time learning that game, changing that game, testing that game. Clearly, it was pointing to my future career, but I really didn't care much about finishing the book. But I, I worked really hard on finishing the game. Um, I think that people come into the game design job through two sort of independent vectors. One of them is entertainment and one of them is math. So if you're a programmer, you become a game designer from you know, first writing your own games on your computer at home and then learning code and, and learning to copy other people's games and getting into it from that perspective. And you think primarily about game mechanics and that is what you perceive as a game. A game is its mechanics and that the story of a game is kind of this shell that's painted on the outside. If you come at game design from entertainment, you think about it backwards and that's where I came from basically. Um, you think of the game as a story first, as a, a story that you try to tell, either a joke or, or a, a very interesting, deep backstory, and then you create a game mechanic or find a game mechanic that fits that story and deliver the whole package that way. I did an engineering degree at University of Missouri Rolla, um, so I did some 
math, obviously, but at the same time, I was also a professional juggler. Yes. <laughs> it's one of those professions where you have to use the word professional. <laughs> and I did that for many, many years. When I moved out to Seattle, I was juggling on uh, street corners and working birthday parties and so on. I did that until I hit the birthday party event horizon moment where my wife made enough money that it was not worth it for me to drive across town for a hundred bucks anymore. Uh, so today I'm doing it for free. Um, but entertainment is my primary perspective on game design. I got involved in the actual game industry, the hobby game industry, the paper game industry, around the time that Wizards of the Coast was just spinning up uh, Magic the Gathering. Have you all heard of Magic the Gathering and Trading Card Game? Wizards was a pretty small RPG publisher at the time that I and my wife both went to work for them in different capacities, and they were just collecting money to invest in this brand new idea, which was a game made on trading cards. And it had been done before with baseball cards, but this was a little different, and uh, it was a pretty exciting idea, and we invested and got involved, and uh, it turned out to be a smash instant huge hit. The first thing that I did for them was freelance editing of their mailing list. GL. Um, I published a digest of that list that wasn't just every message that was on MTGL, but the top 10% of actual signal, stripping out all the noise. And through that, I got to sort of interact with the design team of that game and learn really by trial by fire how to write the rules for a game in a clear way. Uh, this operating system is pretty good, but it can only handle so much. And English is not a, a great programming language. Those two things together make writing game rules, especially for a game as intricate as Magic, where there's 300 different cards that all interact with each other, make that a really big challenge. And one of the first things I did for them, as, long, as well as working on their uh, mailing list, was I volunteered to rewrite the rules. Their first rulebook was terrible, because all first rule books are terrible, and all you know support materials written by the wrong team are terrible. And you know, it was very technically uh, centered, but it was really hard to interpret. So. Um, in the process of, writing, of working on the digest, the process of rewriting the rules, I really learned a lot about just the mechanics of that part of game design, writing the rules so people can understand. I worked for Wizards for a while, but mostly I didn't do game design for them. I did layout and, and editing. And I got to see from inside their company how the hobby game industry sort of worked. Um, there was a, um, a game that they bought from a well-respected designer that they kicked around for three or four years. Nobody really wanted to finish it, but they really wanted to have a good relationship with this designer, and so their definition of a good relationship was to call him up every six months and say, we're still working on it, and never bring the game up. Okay. And I was interested in selling them games also, but I knew that you know, the games I sold would go through this rigmarole. In fact, I wrote them a trading card game very early on, uh, a superhero trading card game that was aimed at kids, you should do a trading card game for kids. And I, and I sold them this game, I sold them the option on the game, but at, because they never really went forward with it, I realized that if I kept wanting to write games for them, kept wanting to sell games for them, they were just gonna go into this black hole. So, in 1996, that's about three years later, um, I started my own company. I had been laid off at Wizards as a, you know, the annual Black Wednesday, which I think was on Tuesday that year. Um, <laughs> I actually sort of shot my hand up and said, lay me off too, because the president was up at, at the front of the company saying that, that all of his designs were going to come from this one designer, Richard Garfield, who had invented Magic the Gathering. Uh, we said, what are our next, where are our next products? What are we going to do next? And he said, I'm sure Richard is thinking of something right now. And as a designer who was also working there, I was like, what about me? I'm thinking of stuff. You know, forget it. So I got out of there. I wanted to make a lot of games. So I started Cheap Ass Games. Cheap Ass Games was designed to fit with what I perceived to be a missing piece of the game publishing industry at that time. There was kind of an arms race in production values as Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering and even basic card, simple card games were getting more expensive to produce and more expensive to, to, uh, to buy. A two-deck card game called Lunch Money came out from Atlas Games and it was $17. That was a lot of money for two decks of cards, at least it seemed like that to me. So there was kind of a gap in the under $10 market that I thought I could fill. There had previously been hobby games under $10, but they had all either sort of matured into more expensive products or gone out of business. And so cheap-ass games, looked, I looked around and said, look, everyone who's starting a new game company is pretending to be bigger than they are. Let me try something else. I'm going to pretend to be smaller than I am. 
I'm going to be I'm going to be very clear that I'm count that I'm iconoclastic. I'm going to call it cheap ass games, and there's going to be places in the South that won't carry me above the counter because it has ass in the title. I swear, <laughs> like all of this was intentional, and I I had to do it basically on my laser printer. I said I'm going to be able to start this game company up for ten thousand dollars. I'm going to do a large number of designs because if I'm going to sell them cheaply, I have to have a lot of games in print. I'm going to print them in incredibly small print runs. So I did 20 and took them to a convention and sold them. And then I, did, I found a place where I could do 200, and then I, finally 1,000. Eventually, I had distribution where I could sell 5,000 of the game, but it took me a while to ramp up into that. I published my own designs pretty much exclusively. There were a couple of designers that I worked with, including including the guy whose game was getting kicked around in Wizards. I bought another game from him and actually published it. So. <laughs> Um, but mostly about 100 games came out for me in the next 10 years after that. Cheap Ass Games was pretty much online for about 10 years. During the course of that, I ramped up the size of my business to kind of an unstable size. Um, there's a theory in business development that you should get bigger or you should go away. And while that's true, there are certain thresholds of size where you're really losing money. And I kind of hit one of those thresholds. I didn't want to get any bigger. I don't want to be a money guy. And I was always frustrated that I was spending more of my time running the business than designing games. You're always going to feel that way, I think. Uh, if you're trying to do what you love for money, you're going to spend more of your time chasing the money than doing what you love. And that's, you know, that's just kind of the way it is. My aunt is a, is a watercolor artist. And if she wants to make money, she paints things that she hates because it's stuff that people will buy. And if she wants to do art, she makes art, and she sits on the gallery and it doesn't go anywhere. That's just a problem that all entertainment people, all artists have to deal with. Anyway, so running my business, I was up to about six employees, which in the hobby game industry is actually kind of medium sized. And um, I had diversified into a lot of different lines. I had made products that were as expensive as $15, and they had color ink and everything. It was crazy. And, <laughs> And these things were, because they were costing me more in production, they were, and there were so many of them, they were starting to stack up in my warehouse. All my profits were stacking up in my warehouse. And it was time to do something different. So in 2004, around about 2005, I don't know, I'm getting these dates wrong, but around about that time, about 10 years into Cheap Ass Games, um, I didn't really have a plan, but a friend of mine who worked at Microsoft and had worked at Microsoft for about 15 years at that point, He's also an independent game designer, and he had published games even cheaper than mine. He had a company called Bone Games, and he just gave away PDFs. He said, here, print this yourself, let me know how you like it. And it was, it was a good business model for him, because it wasn't a business model, it was a way to get his products out of people's hands. He printed a couple of things and tried to sell them, but he really wasn't making a business out of it, because he had a job at Microsoft. And his job at Microsoft at this moment was a producer at Carbonated Games. Carbonated Games was an internal studio that had kind of the feel of an external studio that had been acquired. Uh, they really weren't. They were part of the Microsoft Gaming Zone. Uh, they, they were never an external studio, but they had kind of a uh, uh, isolated mentality that let them create casual games on a fairly quick schedule with a fairly small budget. Okay, he said, come and lecture for us, tell us about game design, and by the way, I want you to interview for this job. And that's how I became the game design manager at Carbonate Games. Um, I worked at Microsoft for about two years, and during that time I worked on about a half dozen projects that got released and about a dozen more that were somewhere in some stage of development. Um, and we heard the list at the beginning, but it included uh, Full House Poker, which is only just recently shipped on the Xbox, um, Hexic 2, and my favorite project was the Fable 2 pub games. Fable 2 is a big RPG out of Lionhead Studios in, in England, and in Fable 2, they wanted to do a set of gambling games which were in the RPG but were also available outside of the RPG. This was kind of a neat concept, which was before the RPG ships, you can buy just the gambling games on Xbox Live. You can play them, and the money you win, you can transport into the RPG when it comes out. That cross-platform interaction was really exciting. It was so exciting that it really slowed the project down because other teams would come in and say, I see what you're doing. I want to do it for mobile. Let me slow you down. And we would be like, get away from me. We're doing it for Xbox. Do it yourself for mobile. Don't, you know, oh, why don't you just spend a couple of days exploring the possibilities of, no. That was frustrating. But the fun thing was, of course, designing some of my favorite kinds of games, which are very simple, casual games. These were all gambling games. And um, casino games is part of my level of interest, my, my area of interest. And 
uh, I got to do a lot of math and analysis and create essentially casino games that I thought uh, RPG players would like. And I think they work pretty well within the context of the RPG. As standalone product, they weren't great. And I'm not really happy with what came out, but that's kind of just the way it is. We had about seven or eight games that I really wanted to put in this package. And because of restrictions of staffing and timing and budgeting and everything, we really got it down to about three. And, and they were the three we could do. They weren't my favorite three. Um, one of the games that I came up with them for them, I think was the perfect game for them, but it, it, we, we came up with it too late, so we just couldn't get into the schedule. Um, one of them, the poker version, every, every one of these games sort of had an analog in, in, uh, in, in the real world, and the one that was based on poker was better with multiplayer. It was not so good, uh, it was also, it was good two-player, but it was better multiplayer, and so they said, well, we're not doing a multiplayer game, so we'll have to not do the poker. I said, well, the two-player poker is still really good. We've all enjoyed playing the two-player poker. So what do we do here? But that one got cut for that reason. And, and I, so I would, the three things that we wound up shipping in the Fable Pup games were the Blackjack variant, which is a game where you decide whether you want to take another card. It's kind of a press your luck game. Uh, much more intricate and complicated. It doesn't really look like Blackjack, but it fills that space. Um, the Craps variant, which is where you bet before the dice roll and you roll the dice and see what you got. And the Slot Machine. Now, two of those three games have zero strategic choice in them. So they're not really gamers' games. And I, as I said, I would have rather shipped more games, of which two was a slot machine and a craps game, but that's what I wound up shipping. Um, that was a long tangent. Anyway, worked at Microsoft for a while, and then got an opportunity uh, with the Amazing Society. And <laughs> unfortunately, it didn't turn out to be what I expected. Some friends of mine who had worked at Microsoft in Carbonated had gone off and joined a new company called the Amazing Society, which was uh, currently, didn't have a name. And, uh, and so that's why I do this, because I go, you basically switch me. It's called this, really, the Amazing Society, seriously? Um, they were called NR2B Research at the time, which I think not ready to be named is what that's <laughs> um, And they were gonna make a lot of casual games. A lot of the casual games for kids. They had some kid properties that they were pursuing. Um, and, I, and they said, come over here and make games for us. And I thought, oh, I love working at small companies. Microsoft is, is a pain. The corporate environment is weird. I don't like ha spending half my time writing my own reviews and interviewing for my own job. And like, let me, you know, let me go do a small company. I like the small company vibe. And these guys were like 12 people at this point. And so I'm gonna go make casual games for a small company. After about the first year there, I survived the first round of layoffs. <laughs> um, they had consolidated their products down to one. They had decided they weren't doing a whole bunch of little casual games. They were going to focus all their energy on one big uh, casual game for kids, which is cool. And the Marvel Superhero Squad uh, MMO is what they called it. It was barely an, an RPG, but it was massively multiplayer and online, so it was technically an MMO. It was a game where kids could log on and, and run around and battle and, and play this trading card game and level up their heroes and find more heroes and it was free to play with microtransactions, kind of the new you know, way that games are being delivered. Play our game for free in this demo mode and then hit these sort of soft invisible walls where if you gave us money the game would get better. Um, so that company ballooned up in size and the project got really big and I became sort of you know, focused on one part of it which was the trading card game. I also helped them engineer the monetization system and figure out how to take money and that was frustrating too because as the as the sort of corporate masters down in California had got more engaged in the game, they were telling us more about what we could and couldn't do in terms of taking money. So there were technological problems with taking money, we can't write this code, and there were legal problems with taking money. We can't take it in this particular way or else the accounting gets hard. Yes, there were accounting problems with how to take money. Um, which is frustrating for the game designer who just says I should be able to sell this this way. It's very easy to explain this to a customer. What you're telling me is we need three different kinds of currency and they have to do this weird back channel thing to get any money out of it. And like, how do I how do I turn what the accounting what the accounting department wants into what the player can understand? Um, so I did not survive the second round of layoffs at that company and I wound up on my own in the spring. Um, and uh, floating around, I wound up uh, meeting with some other folks who I'd worked with at Microsoft who had a small company called Spry Fox. Spry Fox is a, was at that point basically a two-man studio in Kirkland that had uh, teams of developers working on different projects, uh, different casual games, mostly for uh, 
uh, the web. If you want to play a good Spry Fox game, I recommend you play Triple Town on Facebook. It's a match three game, but it's, it's very interesting in the way that they've uh, grown that genre. A basic match three gamers get three in a row and they disappear. In Triple Town, three in a row consolidate into a new object. And then three of that object consolidate into a higher order object and so on. And you have a very limited space to do this in. So it's very fun. And I can say all those good things about it because I didn't work on it. I, I came on board after that was basically already shipped. And uh, what I'm working on for them now is uh, kind of a, we're calling it an RPG, but it's not really because RPGs have a lot of pieces that our stuff don't have. It's a very lightweight game where you have a bunch of characters and you can collect them. And under the surface, the guts of it are basically a trading card game. Uh, if you think of every element in the game, the spells, and the equipment, and the characters all as cards, that's what you're accumulating and that's what you're uh, collecting and trying to build a better deck as you go out and fight against things in the world and also against other players in the game. Um, so my work situation right now is that I work from home and I manage a team of one artist and one developer who are both on the uh, East Coast. So by the time I get done with lunch, they've already left the office. I, <laughs> I get about an hour of sort of chatting with them and then I start throwing stuff over the wall. Um, that game is going to be done after a nine month cycle with three people working on it. Um, and the people that I have working on the team are absolutely amazing. They, they, they turn over great work really quickly, faster than I expect. Um, and so it's a really good working situation for me. Uh, that brings me up to date where I am. That's my, that's my work history. Thank you very much, Paul Brett. So talk a little bit about my design philosophy. Um, games happen here, and I want to engage this part. I want to engage my customer's imagination um, before I get his fingers moving. And my personal way to do that is to tell him a good story. I am kind of alone in this, although I think I'm, I'm, my numbers are growing. Our numbers are growing. The story-based game designers who come into game design from entertainment, who think, what story am I trying to tell with my game? What are my characters? What are my players pretending to do? What emotions do I want my players to have? All of those questions are sort of sketched out before we make any decisions about mechanics. And that's an ideal world, obviously. When I get asked to write a computer game or a card game or a board game, there's some parts of it that are already decided for me. But as little as possible, I hope, before I have a good idea of what the story is. This is good practice when you wind up having to write a licensed game, like the Marvel superhero game, where these characters are already very well defined. Um, to try to translate something that is already an intellectual property but not a game into a game requires the kind of chops that you develop when you start with the story instead of the game mechanics. Um, many game designers come at it through the math vector, through the, the developer or mathematics vector, and so they see games very differently. They see games as a mechanic first, with a skin of theme attached to the outside. And you've probably played games that are like that. Um, games which could really be about anything, but are therefore, in my opinion, kind of about nothing. I don't really feel good about what I'm doing from an imagination perspective. I just kind of get into the guts of it and you know, work the math, that's fine. I can play games that are about math, but I don't enjoy them as much as games that really feel like they're about something weird. So when I do cheap ass games, Almost every cheap ass game, and I, well, let's see, almost every cheap ass game means 80% of cheap ass games were a story, a title, a joke, a character before they were a game. The most successful board game in the cheap ass games line also happens to be the first. And I'll say this I did a lot of my best work when I didn't know what I was doing, so everything I'm telling you now is probably wasted. But, <laughs> title first. The title of this game is Kill Dr. Lucky. As soon as I, you know, said that title in my mind, I was driving across town to visit somebody, I said, Kill Dr. Lucky. As soon as I said that, I knew kind of what the genre was. And I'd written, when I was in college, I'd written some short story about, you know, that was a clue type short story, murder by death short story, where everyone's in the mansion, they all want to kill the, the victim, and then suddenly the lights go out, and then they come back on and it's dead, right? Um, so, so that story was already kind of floating around in my head, but the idea of the game is that same thing. Everyone in Dr. Lucky's house wants to kill him. So you just want to be the one who actually does it. 
No game mechanics, just that story. That's how it started. And I had a development team, a playtesting group, that was helping me build all of the new games for GPS games. We, we, I knew that I wanted to have about a half dozen at launch, and Dr. Lucky was one of those. And it, it immediately rose to the top because it's such a good story. You want to play that game. I haven't told you anything about how it works, but that's just a fun game. It sounds like it's going to be a good time. From that, we said, well, it's probably a board game. There's probably a mansion where you're all walking around trying to kill him. And then we kind of got into mechanics like, well, how do we make it easier or harder to actually win this game? Part of it is, the secret is you don't understand that everyone else also wants to kill him. You can just work together, but you think you're the only one. So you have to be alone in a room with him where no one can see you. And that starts to make mechanics out of nothing. It starts to make mechanics out of the story. And so instead of going to an, an existing board game like Clue, where moving around actually is sort of irrelevant, um, to a real board game where the board is actually doing some work, was the result of having a story in mind before I started designing the game. The next part of the mechanics came out of, well, OK, the story of Doc Kill Dr. Lucky is partially that everyone tries to kill him a lot, and he's very, very lucky. Okay, that makes sense. So you know, it's, it's, it's not so hard to try. It's really hard to succeed. It's fun to make lots of murder attempts. It's not fun to sort of save up all your energy and then I win. So, how is his luck manifest in the game? And the final solution that we came up with was everyone has cards in their hand that represent his luck. So when it's not my turn, you want Doctor Lucky to live. I make a murder attempt, and then everyone else can play cards out of their hand to try to stop that from happening. They're called failure cards running a new card game based on another called luck cards, but whatever they're called. They're the cards that represent Dr. Lucky's luck, so that you hit him for three points, someone plays three points worth of failure, and he gets away again. Ha uh ha, -huh, it's very fun. Actually, it is really very fun. <laughs> By the end of the game, you are, everyone is just like, please die, die, die. <laughs> um, that's been kind of the blueprint since then for how I think games ought to be made. I want to start with an engaging mechanic because, you know, as a marketer, publisher as well as a designer, I want to know what's going to make someone pick up my game off the shelf instead of somebody else's game. I want to know what people are going to say to their friends about my game that's going to make them want to go out and buy it. And talking about the mechanics just doesn't do it for me. There's a collection of people for whom that works, but not most people. At least that's my opinion, and certainly not for me. If you tell me that we want to, we're going to play a game about pirates, I'm right behind you. Tell me we're going to play a game about rolling dice, I don't really care. Right? Now, some games that say they're about pirates aren't about pirates, so we'll talk about that later. But, um, but as a general rule, that's the theme that gets me in the door. It's the, it's, it's the hook that you need to get someone's attention in a very short amount of time to make them commit to listen to you to tell you how the game works. Um, something else about starting with a theme, the mechanics that come out of your theme are going to be more original, and they're going to make more sense than mechanics that you made up and then slapped a theme on top. I'll talk about the pirate game, actually. I'm going to go to hell for this, because you know one of these days, whoever made this game is just going to come and find me and say, stop dissing my game. <laughs> but the game is called Corsairs. Corsair, I can't remember which. And it promises, yeah, you're a pirate. You're all pirates. OK, good. You have a handful of cards, of which some are genuinely pirates. But most of the cards in your hand are commodities. Really? OK, tell me more. There's a harbor of ships, and every ship has written on it the commodities that it wants to be complete. Okay, I'm loading ships, that's good. And off of each ship, in four directions, one for each player, is a ramp where you can play the commodities that the ship wants. Now, get this right, everyone is loading the same ship with different stuff at the same time. And whoever loads the ship perfectly first wins the ship. Really? That's your pirate game? Now, here's where the pirates come in. If you finish loading a ship perfectly, everyone else gets one more turn to also finish loading it perfectly. And then, if two, more, two or more people have done so, then pirates break the tie. Yeah, no, I don't feel like a pirate anymore, <laughs> right? Like, I would rather this game was about nothing. And probably, in the designer's defense, it was about nothing. Or it was about stock trading or something really boring when he wrote it. And then his publisher, the evil publisher, said, I can't do a game about nothing. Let's make it about pirates. <laughs> this is what happens a lot in the European market, to a lesser degree in the American market. When a game designer comes up with a game, it may or not, not be about something when he starts, 
But the publisher's like, well, games with themes sell better than games without themes. So we're going to make up a theme. We're going to make this one about Egypt. And we already have an Egypt game. So this one's about cowboys. And just so on, and again and again and again. And it's a vicious cycle because the designers then realize that even if they did pick a theme, it gets swapped. And so they just don't care anymore. And it winds up with a lot of really bland, generic games coming out of Europe. Interestingly, American hobby gamers tend to be attracted to the generic, bland, boring games because they have a sense that the more thematic a game is, the worse it is. That somehow a game that's about trading sheep and wheat is necessarily more good as a game mechanic than a game about pirates because, I don't know, because that's kind of what they've been trained to believe. I don't know. I just I can't do that. Uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of the state of the hobby game industry right now. So, in the time we have left, let me answer some questions. 20 minutes. Either about uh, process or, uh, or, yeah. Would you say the we struck it big because it brings people into the storyline first? Because it was kind of a surprise. Yes, you're moving around. but. Why is that going to suddenly suck all these people into and across a broad spectrum? So now, now they're personalizing. The yeah, game, I mean, so. I think I think that the success of the Wii and, and Nintendo's products in general are based on the accessibility of it. Like, as much as I say, in the hobby game market, there's a there's a slice of gamers who would rather play a game on cheap and weak because they believe that it's a better game because it's boring. In the console market, there's a slice of gamers who want to play Gears of War because when it's all about shooting people. They realize they think this is a good game, like like first person destroy everything games. Right, walk into the room and kill everything. I played that game. I don't need to play it again. But everyone else wants to play that game. Everyone who's in that narrow slice that Microsoft defines as its core audience. Yeah. So they make hardcore games. They price their systems so that only hardcore gamers feel like they can afford them. They brand their systems. That, you know, the Xbox is the Halo box, right? And as long as they keep pursuing that, that's the customer that they're going to attract. With the Wii, Nintendo said, my customer is the people who don't like those games. These people like bowling and tennis and things that they already know how to play. And so Wii Sports succeeds because it is what it, it, is what it promises. It is bowling. And it, you know the controller is a nice trick. Um, it, 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 it makes, whether you did it with a motion controller or just a simplified controller or whatever, um, Making the game more accessible to non-gamers is why that platform succeeds. And of course, it's derided by the industry uh, for exactly the reasons that make it successful out in the real world. The more you learn about the industry that you're in, the more out of touch you're going to be with your customer, if you're not careful. I don't like Angry Birds for the dumbest reason, because I'm an industry insider. And I know all of the games that worked just like it that I had already played that didn't succeed. And I feel sorry for those guys because I played <laughs> Crush the Castle and I loved it. And then Angry Birds came out and it was just Crush the Castle again with three little birds. And so as a industry insider, I have these ridiculous reasons not to like that game. As a player, I love that game. The game is great. It's cute. It does exactly what I say people ought to do, which is it has a great theme that brings people into the game and makes them want to play it. You know, it's a theme of rebellion, and it's also really cute. Like, please, let me hook me up with that game. So you have to learn which part of your brain is coming from that insider's perspective when you analyze the success of any project, right? When you try to predict the success of any project, when you say, oh, we can't make Angry Birds because Crush the Castle already exists. That happens all the time. And it's a it's a real you know blocking point in brainstorming when when you come up with a, just a sketch of an idea and someone in the room says, I've seen that before, and you let that crush you, don't do it, right? Yes, you've seen something like this before, but we're going to work on this and we're going to make it better. We're going to make a better product that way. This is my brainstorming lecture. You have two brains. You have a child brain and an adult brain. The child brain loves everything. The child brain gets excited about everything has never seen it before and really wants to get behind any great idea. Your child brain loves zombies and wants to make a game about zombies. Your adult brain is very analytical, very grown up. It's the brain that our society teaches us is the more important one. And that's how we learn to listen to it. But during brainstorming, that guy needs to shut up. 
Because he's going to say there's already been a game about zombies. We're done now. Come up with something else. He needs to leave the room. When they say there's no bad ideas in brainstorming, what they're not saying is that there's no bad ideas in brainstorming. Brainstorming is full of bad ideas. What, <laughs> what they're saying is that the guy who says it's a bad idea needs to shut up and let it turn into a good idea. The child brain does have problems. The child brain is so enthusiastic about everything that it can't really get anything done or finish anything. So the adult does have to come in the room when it's time. When the child has made it very clear to you why what you're doing is awesome, then the adult can come in and say, good, I'm glad, I appreciate why that's awesome now, let me help you finish that. But if you are always thinking with your adult brain, if you're always self-critical, you will never come up with a good idea because you won't let yourself come up with a good idea. Uh, I was writing this, this exact section in a, a game design book uh, last spring. And while I was working on it, this, this happened to me. My daughter came up, and she was, uh, she's nine, and she says, I had a dream last night. Okay, tell me about it. Well, we were in South America, and we were hunting lions. And right then, my adult brain said, but not out loud, there are no lions in South America. Because if I'd said that, that would have been the end of the story. I just let her keep talking. And then we all turned into the cast of Scooby-Doo and solved the mystery and got to the end of the story. Whatever, she told me all this other stuff. But I realized that that adult brain coming in and saying, what you just said is technically wrong, is absolutely the wrong thing to do if you want to keep the child talking. So it was fun that that thing actually happened to me while I was writing it up. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it, it happens all the time. And, and it's why people, I think, feel like they're not creative. They are creative. Everyone can create. You can hear a good idea and you can process it and turn it into something new or to come up with it out of nothing. But if you stop yourself too soon, that's why you, that's why you don't agree. Good, good question, what's next? <laughs> you just described my team. <laughs> yeah, right, well, and I'll tell you what, I had that exact experience too. I was, uh, I was invited to pitch a whole bunch of ideas for a new piece yeah. of technology, right? Here's a new piece of technology, and I won't tell you which one it was, but it's, it's great, it's gotta be the next new thing. Okay, great. So, I wrote up a bunch of stuff, pitched it, None of it stuck. They said, come on in for a brainstorming meeting. Let's see what we can do. <clears throat> so my team, me, two other game designers, sitting in the room with a bunch of these uh, uh, you know, guys from the big corporation that I won't name, if I, if I don't screw up. And we would say, idea X. And they had two responses. The first response boiled down to, idea X. I've seen something like that before. Let's move on. And then, okay, all right, idea why. Idea why, I don't really get why that would be good, so let's move on. Like, they had either seen it before, so it was too late, or they'd never seen it, so uh, let's move on. We were like stuck, we were like, okay, I see where your process is here. Your process is you're gonna, you know, you're, the safe move is always to shut me down, that's great, but you're never gonna innovate. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's really funny to read a design doc that I wrote when I was at Microsoft. When I got there, I looked through the hopper of all their existing game ideas, and I tried to pick some stuff that I wanted to move forward with and develop. And one of them was a game based on Pachinko. We all know what Pachinko is. You know, you fire a ball, it bounces around on pins, it goes in holes, you get points, and that's all good. But you don't have any control over the ball. It's not a game in that hardcore, I want, to, I want constantly to tell my ball where to go kind of game. And so I would walk around the studio pitching this idea. It's based on Pachinko. You shoot the ball, you see where it goes. And, and they put up so much resistance to not having control over the ball that the game design doc has paragraph after paragraph of here is why it is fun to just watch the ball go. Then Peggle came out. Huh. Everyone played Peggle and they were like, oh, this is fun. Why is all this nonsense in here about why it's fun to watch the ball go? I thought, because I knew it and you didn't. And now half this document can just be thrown away. Unfortunately, now that someone else has already done one, we can see that we're not going to do that anymore either. So we went straight from game Y to game X. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's, that's the creative process. And, and when you're working with a whole bunch of adult brains, you're gonna get that one. You, know, you have to kind of coax them through. Yeah, this game is, this idea isn't finished. But let me tell you again why it's awesome. And then let's finish it. Yeah. So that's kind of at that front end. Once you've sort of moved beyond that and you're in the process of developing the game and getting feedback about it, uh, could you describe some of that user testing, yeah. how you get in a mindset yeah. to really appreciate what the users are telling you about it. Because you're you're sort of deep in the process of right. understanding right. the game and how it should work and and seeing how some Well, no, no plans are our first contact with the enemy, so any intricate thing that you've made up is going to be terrible. 
but the intricate thing that you made up needs to be based on a solid foundation. Um, I, I don't remember what game it is, but some racing game that basically had the, the, the engineer, the, 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 the designer behind this game wrote down this, I want to drive my car on television. That was it, right? And if, that, if what you were building doesn't support that idea, you're building it wrong. If you have a core idea like that that you can go back to, then you can change what's not working into what does work. Um, the feedback you get is always completely wrong. Playtesters, unless they're also game designers, actually, I won't even say that. All playtesters, including game designers, do not know how to fix your game. But they can tell you what's wrong with it. So learn to understand feedback from that perspective. If, something, if someone tells you that it's blue and they don't like blue, that's probably not right. There's something else going on that they don't like about this game. They just can't articulate it. You need to extract from the feedback what the problem is and then create the right solution. If you just go with the solutions that people offer, you're not really getting the whole picture. That's the game designer's job, um, to really understand why it's not working, not just by the solutions that people propose, but by what problems are really causing them to make those suggestions. People make suggestions about the weirdest things and for the weirdest reasons. And it could be because they're just bored. You know, in fact, if you if you show someone a game and say, we're just going to play this game, their experience of the game will be quite different than if you show someone a game and say, I need you to help me make this better. Because if they put their critical hat on, they'll start making stuff up. If they can't think of what's wrong with it, they'll just make something up. Like, as opposed to if you just say play the game and watch them and see if they're having fun, you'll get better feedback from whether they're having fun during the I'm playing a game state than I'm fixing a game state. Um, so, so there's that, right? So have a core theme. Have a core theme that, that you can go back to. And, and, and this is one of the reasons that I say start with a theme to begin with. Because Kill Dr. Lucky, like if you had to say what's the theme of Kill Dr. Lucky, it is, it's, it's, it's well, that's, 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 <laughs> not, that's the game objective, right? But I mean, what's it going to feel like? It's going to be fun. It should be light. It should be easy to understand. I should really want to kill him by the end, right? Uh, and. The, the, the pieces of that puzzle are not game mechanics, they're, they're emotions, they're feelings, they're, they're a very loose structure for the game. And I think you can do this for any kind of product design, really, to say, this is how I want people to use this product. You know, the iPad is a very technical, uh, you know, technically superior, amazing achievement, but you can describe it in terms of how the player uses it, how the user uses it, very simply. And if you can come back to that and say, this is what I'm shooting for. My first attempt didn't get there, but this is where I'm trying to get. Really, when you just give someone a rule book and say, make this game better, all they have is the rules. And they have to interpret from the rules what you're going for. You know, at least give, tell them where you're headed, tell them where you're going, and that'll, that'll help a lot. Yeah. It seems like the industry is kind of this dichotomy you know, in terms of the creative and the, you know, and the technical, obviously. It's like just like you say, child and adult, yeah. having right brain, left brain as well. So you take all these classes in programming and technically create any, any any movement, any concept, any, anything I want, but it, it's almost like you, in a, to be a good game programmer, you should have a minor in, in literature. Because I, I uh, will approach like you, it's like, it's storytelling. Yeah. The best games are the storytelling. Yeah. What have you, you basically come from it, from a, a strength of you're a better storyteller, but you don't have the techniques. Is there a place for someone who proposes an idea? Says, I've had this whole game laid out, and it's all written out like a, like a book. Like a, novel or a movie, but I don't have the technical know-how how to put it together. Is there a place for someone to approach someone, a group of technical people and say, you know, and convince them, sell it to them that this is going to work? Is there a place? I don't know. Because unfortunately my career has been kind of like a feather in forest mill. You know, I, I just kind of have been blowing from good situation to good situation. But, but I will say that you need to find someone with those skills. When I was published on my own games, um, I had all of those skills. I had a playtest group still, and needed the group to help me build games, and I cannot make a game in a vacuum. Like, like I said, your best plan never survives. But um, I had the technical ability to do print buying and print production, and I could do enough art to get myself through, and do layout and graphic design, and I had typography, and I had all these things that come together into building a physical product. Um, if you don't have those skills, then you need to, of course, obviously, hook up with somebody who does. But um, I think, 
the storytelling skills are undervalued in computer games. So much of the work is done by the people who are technically capable. You know, you have to have a programmer to make a computer game. You, you can get by without a game designer. Not the other way around. You can't just get by with a game designer without a programmer. Um, and that's why you can see the output of that process shifting over to the programmer side just by the law of averages, right? Um, so for your particular situation, I don't know the answer. Uh, but, you, but, but certainly a storyteller who is just that should familiarize himself with the code side of it. Not necessarily learn how to make the game, but at least get a handle on how hard it is and you need to get to do it. This is one of the most frustrating things about my career in computer games is that I'm not really a coder. I wrote computer games when I was in high school. That was a long time ago. And so I sort of have to work with a manager who understands what the programmers are doing or work with a really good programmer who's, who's, who's upfront about his abilities because when someone says, I can't do that, to what I what sounds to me like a very simple, you know, do a, do a physics game in Flash, that can't be done. I have to take that at face value because I don't know, right? I have to go to a third party and say, is this guy just jerking my chain here? Can you do a physics game in Flash or not? And that's a, that's a shortcoming, that's a problem that I have had. I, I, can't, I can't take a feedback from a prototyper uh, without just taking it, without just deleting it at face value because I don't have any experience to show me otherwise. Um, so one of these days I'll learn to write computer programs, but not today. Yeah. I have a program here. That I would love to do that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Take classes. Nice. <laughs> okay, so you're coming at it from a design perspective. People get frustrated. It's the design's fault. It's not the actual structure of the game, mechanics of the game. You messed up on the design, so now this is a design feature you have to change. Yeah. Now, you're, you're a designer, you're working with programmers, do you end up running into a roadblock where you have this concept in your head, it's all making sense, Yeah. and then they go, oh, I can't do that. That's certainly true, but they, often they will not say, I can't do that, they will say there's always a cost. To implement your new design feature will take me three weeks off schedule. And you have to make that decision, that's a tough decision to make. And in fact, when I was in Carbonated, it was a weird situation because prototyping, which we should have been doing a lot of, was not getting very much attention. There, I did not have a dedicated prototyper. Instead, I could have whoever was free. Who's ever free? <laughs> and it turned out to be nobody. Like, if I didn't have a dedicated guy to, to just build prototypes and throw them away a lot, we were not going to get that kind of prototyping work done. Um, so I had my most success with the games that I could prototype on paper. And in fact, if there's any prototyping that you could do on paper, you should figure out how to do that. Running it through the code cycle is going to take a lot of time. Whether the guy's a genius or terrible, it's still going to take some time to try every little change that you want to make to your game. And, um, and uh, yeah, I have so many different directions to go from there. But, but I came to computer games from paper, where making a change to the rules is instantaneous. Right. Where you can say, you know what, I think the sevens are going to be nines. Just you know, play the card game again, but the sevens are all nines. And we just do it. Right. Changing a seven to a nine is not hard. But to say that, OK, we draw three instead of two, or actually we pass left. Pass left, that's impossible. Right? And I, it'll take me a week to write that. But we can do it in the card game. We just pass all our cards to the left. Right? So, so when I sit down with a bunch of computer programmer, you know, game designer types and invent a card game. We're just like, whoa, what did you just do? Because we play like 100 games in an hour. And I'm like, well, this is what I'm used to. And when you flip it over the wall and say, well, give me the results whenever you can, and it takes a week or two to get even the smallest change in, you get sort of frustrated. And you, you kind of have to sort of budget your changes. OK, I'm pretty sure this one's good. And I wind up writing arguments. I wind up writing testimonials why I think this is a good thing for the game. Before I hand it over to the coders, I'll say, I'm pretty sure this is the right way to go. If I can't, just paper test it. Luckily, most of the time, I can just paper test it. Do you break, OK, so there's a break between design and mechanics. Is there also a break between design mechanics and the algorithms, the, the logic side of it? Because guys can code, yeah. but guys a lot of times don't comprehend the, the algorithms that they have to do to make Yeah, well, I, that, that's kind of my job. Um, you know, what, in, on, on the paper side, I say the game designer's job is to do the math so the players don't have to. But certainly, from, on the on the code side, I think I need to I need to set up the algorithms in a clear enough way that they know what they're building. Okay. When you're when you're in the, the code coding mindset, you're like, 
you want to read it off the page and deliver it. You don't want to have to insert stuff or guess what I meant or any of those things that make it really hard to turn a game idea into a finished game. Um, now, because I've produced a lot of my own games, I'm always making these tweaks really late in the process, and so it's hard to have everything spelled out at the beginning. But you kind of have to if you're going to have someone else building it for you. So this is the logic. This is the loot table. This is the exact percentage of each of these things. This is how often you have to roll it. Like all of the things that, that you would sort of make up as you went along if you were doing it yourself. You kind of have to specify before you hand it to the coder, or else it will go back and forth a lot and be sort of confusing. Or he'll, he'll insert something that's like, well, I wasn't expecting this. Yeah, I had to make something up here. Oh, yeah, you're right. I never told you what to do. Yeah. Have you ever had to significantly modify a story to fit within the limitations? Yeah. Um, Usually it's scaling back a, um, a game design, cutting features, something like that. Um, at the story level, you, you, you don't really want to do that because story, story is so simple. You know, story from the, the way that I mean it is not all of the details, all of the characters and backstory, but just like the theme and the feelings of the game. And so that's, it's hard to scale back on that. Um, but we were talking about it before, the, the Pickle Pub games, I wanted to do six at least. Please give me a bunch of games in this casino. And we wound up with three. Because that's the staff that we had, and that's the, you know, that's the time that we could put into it. Uh, and you know, I sort of tricked myself into thinking, that's yeah, fine. We'll do an expansion. We'll get the other three ones in there. But of course, that's never going to happen. So, uh, uh, yeah, you certainly, you certainly wind up cutting features. And each each individual game was a feature. In that case, we had sort of an overarching structure that took care of your money. That's the casino part. That's great. We only have to build that once. And then each game was kind of hanging off of that. And then we could only hang three before we ran out of people. Yeah. Uh, is there any difference between going to an art university to learn game design or being a computer engineer to do game design? Are there different differences in the programs? Yeah. Um, certainly. I, I don't know. I haven't been through either one of them, but, um, but I would expect that there probably are. And one of the best game designers that I know uh, is not a programmer at all, but came up through the art uh, school. He's he's working in Connect now, doing you know game designs with that hardware, and he's he, he and I agree a lot on sort of philosophy of game design. So so yeah, because he's got the artist perspective, it is all about the user's experience first, and not how the game works. I think this goes back to what I was saying about if you're too involved in something, you, you see it from a really different perspective than the users do. So you sort of have to learn to.